A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 17, Part 7. Miracle at Midway. What occurred next was nothing short of what historian Gordon Prang termed a miracle at Midway. Determined to force the last two carriers out in the open and destroy them, Yamamoto moved an invasion force toward Midway. His real goal, though, was to lure the American carriers into positions for destruction. Midway's airfield had to be eliminated first. Japanese attacks failed to knock out the airfield, requiring second strikes. But where were the carriers? After receiving reports from scout planes he had sent out in an arc around Midway, Admiral Chuchi Nagomo ordered a second attack on the island. Only one scout had yet to report when Nagomo rolled the dice and ordered his tactical bombers to rearm for another attack on the island. In the midst of this tedious reloading process, word arrived from the last scout. The American carrier fleet was right below him. At that point, Nagomo countermanded his previous order and then instructed the aircraft to prepare for attacking the carriers, which required a complete change in the types of armaments on the planes. Apparently out of nowhere, several squadrons of American planes from the two U.S. carriers launched independently and groping blindly for the Japanese fleet, all converged at the same instant. They were shot down. This actually was good news in disguise. In the process of wiping out the attackers, the Japanese Zeros ran out of fuel. And there was another delay as they landed and refueled. Suddenly, another squadron of American dive bombers appeared above the Japanese fleet, which, with no fighter cover and all its planes, bombs, and fuel sitting exposed on the aircraft carrier decks, was a giant target in a shooting gallery. Some of the American aircraft, astoundingly enough, had come from the Yorktown, her three-month repair job completed in 48 hours by some 1,200 technicians working nonstop, many transferring to the Yorktown by air to start working on her while she was still at sea. In a matter of minutes, planes from the Yorktown's aircraft joined planes from the Enterprise to cripple and set fire three of the carriers, and a follow-up strike by the other U.S. carriers reserves the following day, destroyed the fourth. All had to be scuttled when their tow ships could not get them back to Japan. Yorktown herself was again badly damaged and was sunk by a Japanese sub on her way back to Pearl. But the United States had pulled off its miracle. Not only did Japan lose four modern carriers, plus the Shoho, which had been lost at Coral Sea, leaving them with barely half their entire force, but Japan also lost nearly 100 trained pilots. Japan never recovered, and in the blink of an eye, the empire's hopes for victory had vanished. The Japanese never won another substantial victory, and even though bloody fighting continued on many islands, Japan, for all its intents and purposes, lost the war in June 1942. The End of the Thousand Year Reich Germany's invasion of Russia in June 1941 led to a string of victories as sweeping and unrelenting as Japan's early conquest of Asia, putting Nazi forces just 10 miles outside Moscow. In retrospect, the German assault on Russia was a huge blunder, pitting Nazi armies against the bottomless pit of Soviet manpower and the vastness of Russian geography. At the time, even many Wehrmacht officials knew they lacked the resources to pull off such a military operation. Germany's supply lines were widely overextended, and Hitler's generals, who had warned him they needed far more trucks and tanks, displayed astonishment at the incredible size of Russia, which seemed to swallow up their army. Nevertheless, Nazi successes led Stalin's diplomats to press the British and Americans for immediate relief through an invasion of Europe. As of 1942, neither the United States nor Britain, nor certainly the limited free French nor Polish forces that had retreated to England, 
had nearly enough men or materiel in place to achieve a successful invasion of France from the English Channel. In August 1942, the British tried a mini-invasion, called a reconnaissance in force at Dieppe, which proved a disaster. The debacle did, however, alert Eisenhower to the difficulties of breaching Hitler's defenses, called the Atlantic Wall, which was a gigantic series of concrete bunkers, pillboxes, barbed wire, minefields, and tank traps built by tens of thousands of slave laborers and prisoners of war. Between January 1942 and July 1943, the war continued on another hidden but absolutely vital front. Germany's U-boats had conducted a devastating undersea war against shipping from America to Britain and the Soviet Union. Whatever industrial might the United States had was meaningless if it was unable to get war materials and food to England and Russia. In January 1942, a German submarine force of only six vessels unleashed a ferocious series of attacks on ships leaving U.S. ports. Many were sunk within sight of the coast, their silhouettes having marked them as easy targets against the lights of the cities. During a six-month period, a handful of U-boats sank 568 Allied ships. Carefully moving his force around, German Admiral Karl Dönitz kept the Allies off balance, returning to the North Atlantic in November 1942, when any escorts had been diverted to support the landings in Africa. That month, Dönitz's U-boats sank 117 ships. This rate of sinking exceeded even Harry Kaiser's incredible capacity to build Liberty ships. Finally, under the direction of Admiral Ernest King, a combination of air cover, added escorts, including small carrier escorts that could launch anti-submarine aircraft quickly, and the convoy system, the United States slowly turned the U-boat war around. New location devices, sonar and radar, added to the search for subs as did the application of information gained from the ultra-code-breaking team. By May 1943, when 30 U-boats were sunk, the Allies made the sea lanes relatively safe. Again, however, only a narrow margin separated victory from defeat. A handful of subs had come close to winning the war in the Atlantic. Had Hitler shifted even a minimal amount of resources to building additional subs in 1941-1942, there could have been disastrous consequences for the Allies. In the meantime, Germany's success in Africa under General Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox, had convinced General Dwight D. Eich Eisenhower, commander of the Allied forces in Northwest Africa, that the British plan for retaking North Africa was both necessary and feasible. I commanded a multinational force with the November 1942 landings in Casablanca, French Morocco, Algiers, and Oran now opening a true second front in North Africa. Americans under Eisenhower now closed in on Rommel from the west, while British General Bernard Montgomery's desert rats of the 8th Army pushed into Tunisia from Libya in the east. Cornered there, the Germans' final hope of pushing eastward to link up with the Japanese vanished. Allied control of the air and sea space in the Mediterranean left the Axis forces completely isolated. In May 1943, more than a quarter of a million German and Italian soldiers surrendered, dealing Hitler his first serious defeat and securing the Mediterranean for Allied navies once and for all. But Allied forces failed to bag the Desert Fox, who escaped to supervise construction of the Atlantic Wall that the Allies would have to breach in June 1944. Axis powers in the Mediterranean were also fatally damaged by the inability of the combined German-Italian forces to bomb or starve Little Malta into submission. Some 3,000 bombing missions were ordered against the island which at times was defended only by a half a dozen biplanes that resulted in sinking 31 resupply ships. At one point, the Germans turned back almost all the vessels in a critical convoy until the fate of Malta rested on the world's fastest freighter, the SS Ohio. 
Through the efforts of two Americans, Fred Larson and Francis Dale, the Ohio limped into Malta to deliver tons of precious oil that kept the aircraft, generators, and anti-air operations alive. Upon such slender threads is history often woven. Germany's defeat in North Africa technically opened for Stalin his much-desired second front, but to little avail. Hitler had dedicated no more than a small portion of Germany's resources to Africa. However, Sicily, and later mainland Italy, now lay open for invasion. In July 1943, after deceiving the Germans with an elaborate hoax involving a corpse that washed ashore in Spain, with information that the invasion would occur in Greece, Patton and Montgomery invaded Sicily at different spots on the island. The ruse worked. Hitler had reinforced Greece, and advancing American troops encountered enthusiastic Italian citizens who greeted the liberators with cries of, Down with Mussolini! and Long Live America! Italian soldiers surrendered by the thousands, and townspeople threw flowers at GIs and gave them wine and bread. If the Italian army no longer posed a threat to the invaders, the German troops that remained proved far more determined and skillful, mining roads, blowing up bridges, and otherwise successfully delaying the Allied advances long enough to escape back to the Italian mainland. The defeat on Sicily coincided with increased Italian dissatisfaction with Mussolini and his unpopular war, and it occurred at a pivotal moment during the struggle in the East. Hitler, weighing whether to continue the offensive at Kursk with reinforcements or to divert them to Italy, chose the latter. His concerns about Italian allegiance were well-founded. While the forces were en route, Allied aircraft dropped propaganda leaflets urging the Italian people to abandon the regime. And on July 24, 1943, even the fascist ministers in the Grand Council agreed to hand control of the Italian army back to the king, Victor Emmanuel III, who accepted Mussolini's resignation. Marshal Pietro Bedugolio, El Duce's successor, signed an unconditional surrender in September 1943. Germany reacted before the Allies could actually occupy the mainland of Italy or before Mussolini himself could be captured. But from that point forward, the Eastern Front's reserves went into permanent decline as Hitler was forced to throw increasingly large number of troops against the British and American. The Nazis' 13 divisions, more than 100,000 men, arrived, seized Rome and other major cities, and freed Mussolini from his house arrest, reinstalling him as a puppet dictator. That meant, of course, that Hitler was then calling the shots for all of Italy. German General Albert Kesselring, who directed the German defense, instructed his troops to dig in across the rocky northern part of the country and fortify every pass. Patton's open field tank tactics would have been useless even if he had remained in command, but an incident in which he slapped soldiers for cowardice on two separate occasions prompted Eisenhower to discipline him. Patton's temper tantrum, which his biographer suggests may have been caused by the general's own battle fatigue, was a blessing in disguise because it saved him from a slow and bloody slog up the Italian coast. Murderous fire and dogged resistance by the Germans delayed the American conquest of Italy, which had another unintended effect. A rapid Italian campaign would have enabled the Anglo-American forces to invade the Balkans, preventing Eastern Europe from falling into the grasp of the Red Army. Instead, Naples fell on September 30, 1943, after which Allied troops plotted inch by inch up the coast, covering less than 100 miles by June 1944 when Rome was liberated only two days before the D-Day invasion. And we'll go on with the longest day in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.